Good morning, I'm Llewellyn King, and I welcome you to this United States Energy Association virtual press briefing. I am a journalist with some long experience covering energy and other topics, both in broadcast and in print. And we're going to start this morning, which is an examination of the impact of the infrastructure spending coming from the Biden administration in the utility space. But we're going to start with a quick word from Sheila Hollis, the interim executive director of the United States Energy Association. Thank you, Thank you, Llewellyn. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, and USEA is uh, proud to sponsor uh, these, this series of programs, which uh, Llewellyn is kind enough uh, to organize. Uh, before I uh, became the uh, acting executive director, I practiced law in DC for a long time and uh, did two stints in government. Uh, and uh, the subject of New York power is a tremendous, a tremendous interest um, as I represent the New York Public Service Commission for a number of years and a uh, number of cities in, uh, in and around uh, New York. So with that, uh, let me tell you a little bit about USEA. United States Energy Association is a nonprofit, non-lobbying, nonpartisan organization. Uh, it was founded in 19, 1924. It has two primary uh, activities. First is to convene, as in the sponsorship of this uh, press conference. And secondly, we work uh, throughout the world with USAID uh, State Department. Uh, and the energy department to improve uh, the life uh, and uh, quality of life of peoples throughout the world, uh, Africa, South America, Eastern Europe, um, Central America, and Asia. And uh, we have a, a variety of uh, very senior, uh, sophisticated people who work directly for us. And we work also with USAID with, uh, with contractors and subcontractors throughout the world basically to make life better on planet Earth and also to convene and educate and provide as much information, timely information, both with respect to the United States, but also what's going on in the world. Uh, it's been a pleasure to know Llewellyn over all these years in many settings and many times. Uh, and many of you I know uh, and uh, have worked with in one capacity or another over many years. So with that, I turn it back over to you, Llewellyn. Uh, Thank you. I'm honored to Thank have you present with us today again, Llewellyn. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I'm going to introduce our panel of distinguished experts. Uh, first up, Justin Driscoll, Interim President and Chief Executive Officer of the New York Power Authority. Andrew Shaw, a partner at Denton's, the world's largest law firm. And Katie Hereza, Vice President of Corporate Affairs at the Electric Power Research Institute, and she's based in Washington. And Peter Londa, President and Chief Executive Officer of Tantalus Systems, a technology company serving more than 200 small public power entities. Our reporters, my colleagues, are Ellie Potter from S&P Global, Jeff Beatty from the Energy Daily, Ken Silverstein from Forbes, and Robert Walton from Utility Dive. Thank you all for coming today. We appreciate your taking the time and sharing your wisdom with a larger audience, uh, particularly of journalists. We will start with a few words, please, from Justin Driscoll, a few positioning words, if you will. Yes, thank you, Llewellyn, and uh, thanks to USCA for hosting this um, press briefing, and uh, thank you for, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, the New York Power Authority is a very interesting entity. We're the largest state-owned utility, public power utility in the U.S., and we have an interest. We have an interesting portfolio of assets. We have about six gigawatts of generation, mostly uh, hydro, uh, generated by our large hydro facilities. One in Niagara, New York, and the other in um, Messina, New York. And we also have a large pump storage facility, one of the largest uh, pump storage facilities uh, at 1,100 megawatts in Schoharie County in New York. And, and as you know, that's, that's like a big battery where we pump, we pump water up into the reservoir and then we drop it down and generate power uh, at the appropriate time. We also, um, we also own about a third of the high voltage transmission grid, pretty much the backbone of the high voltage transmission system in the state. And we have an interesting customer base um, of governmental customers, primarily New York City, the <laughs> Port Authority, and local 
local governments uh, around the state. So it's an interesting portfolio, uh, an interesting utility. And we have total revenue of about 2.7 billion uh, per year. And so uh, it's an interesting place to be at an interesting time in the energy industry. And of course, we're all very excited about the prospect of a large infusion of money, uh, both to support potentially in-flight projects that we're doing currently, whether transmission, modernization, or customer projects, or potential projects in the future. So excited to um, be part of the uh, be part of this conversation. Thank you, Justin. Um, Andrew Shaw from Dentons. Well, thanks to USEA uh, for the invitation for convening uh, this forum. Uh, it's uh, great to be with everyone today, and it's great to be part of, of this uh, very esteemed uh, uh, panel uh, this morning. I, I would echo what Justin would say. It's a, a really interesting and, and exciting time uh, to be in the energy industry, and particularly in, in the electricity sector. I think in, in uh, particular, you know, there's so much division in Washington, D.C. We all see it every time we pick up the newspaper or, or turn on the TV. But we, what we saw in this infrastructure bill is really a continuation of what we saw last year, which was a, the first energy bill um, in uh, 13 years. And, and you see uh, strong bipartisan support for some key aspects of, of energy issues, whether that be bolstering the resiliency and reliability of the electric grid, whether that be maintaining existing uh, nuclear generation, investing in clean hydrogen, uh, carbon capture, hydropower, uh, those areas. So it, it's really, um, I, I think it is reassuring amidst all the other rancor that we often see in DC, that particularly on energy issues, that there has been some cooperation and, and really with this infrastructure bill, significant funding and significant progress. So. I'm excited to see how this unfolds um, over the coming years. This is a um, not a, a necessarily a stimulus bill, but a long, a medium to long term investment uh, in the industry and in our in our infrastructure more broadly. I uh, kind of the final uh, uh, point I would make at the outset. You know, the grid is is at the central of the energy title. It's the first part of of the title, and I think that that is a reflection of how important resiliency and reliability uh, is to the broader uh, electricity system, obviously, and, 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 and to the, the broader economy as well. And, and you see that with the focus and the centrality of those provisions uh, in the infrastructure bill. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, JT Hereza from uh, APRI, which we know because we can see it behind you, Katie. Welcome to the broadcast. So true, so true. So thank you, Llewellyn, and good morning. And thank you to USCA for inviting me. I'm EPRI Vice President, Corporate Affairs, Katie Heresa. EPRI is an independent nonprofit organization which conducts research and development relating to the generation, delivery, and use of electricity for the benefit of the public. We bring together our scientists and engineers, as well as experts from academia and industry to help address sector challenges to keep electricity clean, affordable, and reliable. So as we know, President Biden signed into law the bipartisan $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. The bill sends a strong signal as we work towards a clean energy future. It makes historic investments to help build out electric vehicle and grid infrastructure and will drive essential R&D for hydrogen, nuclear, and other clean energy sources. It's going to take a bit of time for DOE, DOT, EPA, and other federal agencies to sort out implementation and funding opportunities of the infrastructure bill. For example, DOE officials said they're planning to hire about a thousand employees at the agency to assist with spending the money efficiently and effectively, and noted it's the biggest investment in DOE since the agency's founding in 1977. That's just one agency, but it gives you an idea of the size and scope of this effort. EPRI is working to help identify affordable and reliable carbon reduction pathways for industry and government to use as a roadmap. The electric sector will play a crucial role in achieving the US government's climate goals, as many sectors of the economy, including transportation, buildings, and industry, will achieve large carbon emissions reductions through electrification 
and other low carbon energy strategies where the electric sector will also have an important role to play. However, there's no silver bullet that will get us to global decarbonization. It's going to take all available tools and resources working together throughout the energy sector to meet this goal. So as we lay the groundwork now to make economy-wide carbon reductions in the coming decades, it's important to ensure the clean energy transition is equitable and sustainable while keeping electricity accessible, affordable, and reliable for consumers in the US and around the world. So thanks, Llewellyn, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Katie. And now I'll go to Peter Lund, the president and CEO of Tantalus Systems, a smart grid company. Peter. Well, thank you, Llewellyn um, and Sheila and the team at USEA. Uh, thank you for including Tantalus Systems in today's panel. It's truly a privilege to be here. Um, to Llewellyn's comments, um, I have the honor of serving as uh, president and CEO of Tantalus Systems, which is a publicly traded smart grid company that is truly focused on serving utilities. Uh, within that, we are supporting over 200 public power and electric cooperative utilities today across the United States, Canada, and the Caribbean Basin. Our purpose is, is very simple. It's to truly help build sustainable utilities from a financial, operational, and environmental perspective. And as we think about executing on our purpose and helping the members of our user community in real time, um, this, this panel is, uh, and, and the activities in Washington, DC to allocate dollars to upgrade the grid infrastructure couldn't be more timely. If, if we take a step back and, and think about our society, we all rely on electricity for everything that we do, even in today's virtual environment with this panel. But for electricity, our devices aren't powered to convene today in a virtual setting. And so as we think about what's unfolding in the electric utility industry, there is a wave of an energy transition that is forthcoming, partly tied to extreme weather events, that are unfolding almost daily at this point. Um, that leads to a massive amount of pressure on utilities to improve their resiliency and their reliability. Um, and, and, and that then leads to how utilities can execute on that as we witness the electrification of everything, transportation in particular, with the amount of attention that electric vehicles are getting, uh, across the consumers and, and the United States government for that matter. While those are all beneficial investments from an environmental perspective, they have a cascading impact on the utilities infrastructure and their ability to reliably deliver an increasing amount of electricity in a reliable manner and, and in an environmentally friendly manner. Um, and that's, that's where Tantalus comes in. We're helping utilities confront those challenges head on and leverage technology to, to truly build sustainable organizations. And so privileged to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. And we'll go to the question and answer session. Uh, Jeff Beatty of the Energy Daily. Uh, we're not hearing you, Jeff. Um, we're not hearing you. Um, let's go to... Uh, to Ken Silverstein at Forbes while Jeff gets his sound sorted out. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask Peter just to elaborate on, uh, he sort of stopped his, his thinking, I guess, in order to uh, um, allow for questioning, but the logical follow-up question is, what is your company doing to help utilities confront this challenge Head on, whether it be extreme weather events, whether it be the onset of, of the electrification of everything, including vehicles, uh, what specifically are you doing and, and how does this ensure resiliency and reliability? Sure. So, so thanks for the question, Ken. Um, at, at the highest level, we are um, deploying a smart grid platform on behalf of the utilities we support that transform the distribution grid from, from the substation down to the meter. 
uh, into a digital network of connected devices. And so within that, we are helping utilities deploy a proprietary and secure communications network. Uh, we are embedding edge computing capabilities into devices like meters, load control switches, um, distribution automation equipment, and a variety of other types of assets that a utility is, is responsible for managing and deploying. And, and based on connecting to those devices and effectively turning the devices that utilities have relied on for decades, we're migrating those into an effective iPhone uh, where we can send and receive data uh, in a very granular manner around consumption and power quality data. Uh, and from there, leveraging that data to help provide visibility into what's unfolding, whether that's how consumption patterns are trading are, are, are trending at a home or building, potentially based on an electric vehicle charging station being deployed or a, 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 an increase in the amount of air conditioning. Um, in addition to consumption, we're pulling power quality data back from all devices from substation down to meter across feeders, across circuits, and at the device level, such that utilities can start to pinpoint fluctuations and anomalies in current and voltage. And from there, pinpoint why are those anomalies unfolding? Is it tied to poor vegetation management? Is it tied to a transformer that is not properly sized as a potential neighborhood or area has expanded? Um, is it tied to insulators and um, insulation um, failing or being eroded because of weather? And so it's really the access to granular data through our system that provides much more predictability to the utility such that they can prioritize their CapEx which is critical for public power and electric cooperative utilities. From there, in terms of today's discussion, Ken, as we can help utilities pinpoint where they have vulnerabilities or inefficiencies by collecting data from devices, we can help them prioritize investments that lead to applications, not only to the new Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which I know is the basis of Lou Helen's discussion today, but also the stimulus dollars tied to recovery from COVID-19 and some annual grants that FEMA manages around building resiliency and community projects. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Beatty, let's try you again. No, I'm not hearing you. Uh, we have a problem there. Let's go to Ellie Potter of S&P Global. Hi, Ellie. Hi. Thank you so much to the USCA for having this and for inviting me to take part in it. Uh, my question is to Justin. I wanted to see, uh, you noted transmission funding. I wanted to see, um, you know, with this infra infrastructure bill, there was a lot of transmission investment, how that benefits the New York Power Authority. And then also just in general, how you would like to see some of those transmission funds, um, you know, spent. Thank you, Ali. Um, well, it's interesting, you know, we, we've, um, We've already, as you can imagine, done a substantial amount of work uh, modernizing our existing grid. Um, we've got a we have several transmission projects, you know, in flight, and we have one uh, that's that could potentially launch within the next year. Um, I would think that for us, I mean, we're we're in, we've embarked on what we call uh, our end to end digital utility strategy, where we want to become an end to end uh, all digital. A public power utility. And so we've deployed 80,000 sensors across our system, both transmission and generation. So any funding that could be deployed from the infrastructure bill that would support or enhance that modernization work that we're doing on the existing grid, improving communications, for instance, um, we take those uh, sensors and we download all that information, all that data into what we call our integrated smart operations center here in White Plains where we've created effectively digital twins of our system, both generation and transmission. So we get all these data points fed into the system and then we can, we can determine, it's sort of along the lines that Peter was talking about, we can determine whether there are variations from normal operational metrics and we can sometimes spot issues before they cause unplanned outages, which saves us incredible amount of money. So 
that would be one area on the transmission side. And then of course, any, any funds that could be deployed to uh, subsidize or support transmission build out. Um, we just were awarded by the New York, uh, by the NYSERDA, um, the, uh, what we call the Clean Path New York project, which is an $11 billion project combining generation and transmission. Uh, it's a huge project to deliver renewable power into New York City, which has largely been supported by fossil generation up to this point. So this would be a direct injection of uh, renewable power into uh, New York City. So it's a massive project and to the extent that funding could be uh, deployed there uh, to fund a portion of that project, that would be obviously huge as well. But any, any existing transmission project in flight could be supported by the funds, I would think. Thank you. Um, uh, let's go to uh, Robert Walton of Utility Live. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, this could probably go to to any of the panelists, but maybe start with um, with Andrew. What type of guidance is needed? Uh, we saw that the White House this week indicated they were going to start rolling out guidance for um, how cities and states might access um, funding for a, a nationwide EV charging network. Obviously, there's a lot more in in the infrastructure bill. What type of guidance will be needed um, just in general to access those funds to make sure the rollout is smooth? Yeah, that's a thank you for the question, Robert. And it, it, it's going to be a, a challenge, I think, frankly, and it, it's going to be time intensive. And, you know, kind of going back to some of the initial comments at the outset, you know, I think DOE views this as a transformational bill, not so much a, a a stimulus bill, given that our economy is humming along fairly good right now. Um, but to Katie's point, you know, I, I think DOE is going to have to, to to staff up, and I think they're planning to to be able to deal with all the work that's going to have to come down the line with implementing this bill. I think there are, are, are a number of of broad issues that DOE is going to have to deal with uh, in this bill. You know, one of them is Buy America. That, that has um, broad applicability across the infrastructure bill and across uh, kind of federal, uh, federal funding and federal procurement uh, these days, but that's particularly in, in important in, in the utility space and the electricity space, and, and that's an issue um, that, that DOE is going to have to deal with. I think there, there are issues with things like cost share, with eligible entities that are going to take um, some work by DOE, by stakeholders, by, by industry in working with DOE to be able to get definitions and guidance as, as to uh, how and who should be eligible for funding. I think one last uh, area too, just to flag for you uh, in one specific program is the nuclear program, uh, DOE uh, authorized is authorized under this bill to run a, a six billion dollar uh, support program for existing reactors that are at risk of closure. Um, you know the kind of lurking in the background is, is the reconciliation bill and, and the potential production tax credit for existing nuclear reactors. So how those two programs um, necessarily um, work together, I, I think, kind of remains to be seen. Obviously, uh, a lot of uncertainty right now with the reconciliation bill. But those are some top line issues that I'm, I'm hearing from uh, stakeholders right now. Uh, right, we'll try uh, Jeff BT again. Jeff, can you hear me? Hi, hi. can you hear me? Can people yes. hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry, sorry about that. You would think two years of the pandemic gave me enough time to learn Zoom. But um, anyway, thanks, thanks again for having me. Um, I just, I have a pretty basic question. When you look at this bill, it's sort of, it's sort of the electrify everything bill. We're electrifying ferries, school buses, cars. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some building electri electrification things in there too. And I just wonder whether people think that the nation's you know, power supply portfolio and the grid itself can, can handle this. And if not, where's the, um, where's the investment gonna need to go most critically so that we can handle this? Anybody want to take that? How about Katie? 
Sure, I'd be happy to, to start off with this one. So um, it, the electrification is, um, it's huge. I mean, the infrastructure bill includes 7.5 billion for installation of new EV chargers. And according to DOE, there are currently about 43,000 public EV charging stations throughout the country and around 120,000 charging points. So they pledged to have at least 500,000 charging stations by 2030. So those are really big numbers, right? So to meet that ambitious target, there will need to be a serious increase in EV infrastructure across all 50 states. And this will need a thorough review of existing utility processes, regulatory processes, who will pay the costs, and often the sequential steps that are needed for the review and input because you just don't deploy today, everything you today builds on tomorrow. And so EPRI's working with, we, with all these things in mind, EPRI's partnering has partnered with DOE to develop a national EV charging infrastructure blueprint. It's including fast charging and grid interaction. And because in order to be prepared, we really need to think about, um, assess the needs in terms of connectivity, communication and protocols for the utility down to the vehicle to support electrification of the full vehicle fleet. We've also launched a uh, fleet electric vehicle infrastructure initiative focused on developing the tools and resources needed for this rapid expansion of fleet charging infrastructure. So the initiative builds on EPRI's comprehensive electric transportation program, which is more than three decades of research experience. So I think with this, we've got a lot of experience to build upon, and um, we're launching a utility fleet planning optimization tool to proactively assess these infrastructure requirements. So I hope that gets yeah, great, Katie. I'd like to ask you a question. Thank you. Um, uh, building on your knowledge of the internal operation of DOE as a former executive there, uh, how is DOE handling it? This is outside of its uh, normal skills uh, uh, portfolio. What is happening? So I would say, um, thank you for the question because I um, was a contractor to the Department of Energy when the ARA, the first stimulus for the smart grid investments occurred. And they had to scale up from 150 million roughly at the Office of Electricity to 4.3 billion at the time. And um, I say fortunate for us, there's a lot of those same people that, that are there, like Pat Hoffman is in an acting position. There's many people there. So they've not ever seen this scale before, but they certainly have the people in place, some processes, many lessons learned. And so it's really being able to find all those thousand people that they need in order to scale up quickly. But I really think that the, the you know, we've got some amazing um, federal, um, staff over there that have um, some expertise in scaling up quickly, and I'm sure there'll be bumps along the way, but I think um, that the technical topic is something that they've been looking at. You know, they're, they've been, they've, they've had these issues in the pipeline, I'd say for, you know, over the past 10 years, they've been looking at it, and now they're probably really excited to be ready to transfer some of that technology and get it out to transform um, our integrated energy system. Thank you. Ken Silverstein. I was wondering, thank you, Lou Ellen, for, for having me uh, on your panel um, and to the USEA for, for being so gracious with me. Um, I was wondering what is the most critical investment uh, as part of this infrastructure package? And, and you can speak broadly. Is it the technology uh, to enable um, more green electrons to flow over the grid, that is maybe the smart grid element of it? Is it the, the deployment of more of hard assets, more wind and solar generation? Um, is it maybe development of nuclear? Uh, and without sort of relying on the ironclad answer of it's all of the above, what's the most critical place uh, to, to focus um, at least, you know, right now when this money is coming through. Who are you directing this at, Ken? Um, well, I, I guess I would ask APRI, but, but to avoid um, 
the question to avoid and in and, and New York Power Authority. But I, I understand we need all of the above, but but what what's what's you still have to prioritize it. Um, uh, Justin, would you like to begin? Or I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, well, for us, you know, as you look at the, the goals that we've established for ourselves here in New York State, 70% um, uh, clean energy by 2030, 100% by 2040. And given that we have this, uh, what we call the tail of two grids here with um, the New York City area, the major load center being, um, being uh, basically uh, supported by or served by almost entirely fossil generation. And then uh, a lot of land up <laughs> and uh, room for wind and solar projects. Um, for us, if we're, if we're going to get to these clean energy goals that, that, that our state has established and the federal government uh, is driving toward, you need transmission, right? Transmission is going to be huge. So the development of, of, um, of high voltage transmission, uh, both AC and DC, uh, to us would be a priority. And, yeah. and the, with, I'm, I'm sorry to follow up on the transmission part of it. I, I mean, even I've written stories about the need for expanded transmission and you get deluged with, um, I mean, your inbox gets, gets deluged um, with negative comments. So what do you do in order to sell this to a, to a public or a portion of the public that is yeah. not? So, yeah, uh, I think from our perspective, because we do own a substantial uh, part of the bulk transmission system already, it's utilizing in the best way possible existing rights of way. I think that's always a good response to, to the opposition that you receive about building new transmission. Uh, when it's in existing rights of way, that's a, that's a, that can be a hugely beneficial factor. So I think that would be one. And then just improving technologies, I guess, would be another. Katie, if it's all right, sorry. If, if it's all right, I might just offer something too on, on the transmission bed, and it's probably not as relevant necessarily for the New York Power Authority, but the, the infrastructure bill bolsters uh, FERC's ability to have backstop authority for approving transmission lines of regional significance if a state uh, or, or either uh, uh, disapproves a, a permit or fails to act. So I, I think that's an important part of this puzzle because the funding is clearly important, but a lot of projects obviously have faced state and local challenges so that that backstop authority for the commission will be important, I, I think, in hopefully moving some, some projects forward. Granted, we have to see how FERC moves forward with that authority over, over the coming years, but um, you know, there's so many challenges when it comes to the various levels of state, local, and federal uh, permitting for big interregional uh, transmission lines. Thank you. Ellie Potter? Yes, my question is, can we do this cleanly, you know, um, kind of building on Jeff's question, um, if we're going to electrify everything, can we do that using lower carbon um, energy sources in time to meet some of these ambitious goals? You know, if we're going to have 500,000 charging um, uh, chargers uh, for electric vehicles by 2030, you know, are we going to have enough renewables on the grid? Um, you know, in order to support that, or is this going to create a huge demand for more carbon intensive fuels? Um, I'm not sure if anybody just wants to take that or. Well, Let's ask Katie to take sure. it. Sure, thank you, Lyle. I'm just gonna jump right in. So I think that um, when we look, as we were talking, I was starting to think about how, like there's lots of challenges, right? So Andrew brought some of those up, but I agree that like, when we think about that, there's, let's think differently about the status quo. We really have to take a hard look at that and the timeline of our global climate goals. And so when I mean the timeline, it's not, what I'm trying to think of is we need to build on what works today to, and also think of the future at the same time. So longer term, we'll need to drive innovation by building on what works today. Ubiquitous vehicle electrification, low carbon resources, including hydrogen, biofuels, biogas, and other low carbon resources. 
energy efficiency, and cleaner electricity generation. So with technology approaches that will be viable this decade, it's so through 2030, we think that there are a lot of technologies that can be deployed today, perhaps to get us 80% there. But then to get to that final 20%, we're already starting to look at low carbon resources and what we can do with them to achieve the goals to net zero to 2050. Uh, Robert Walton. Thanks. Yeah, I guess building on that, as we electrify uh, more end uses, transportation buildings, um, is there funding, and I guess maybe for Peter, is there funding in this bill um, to make those work as resources, uh, not just to, to bring them to electrify, but to, to bring them as something that utilities can use, you know, as dispatchable to help run the grid? Yeah, thanks, Robert. And I think it ties a little bit to Ellie's question as well. Um, a, a lot of focus will be rightfully so allocated to the generation side and the transmission side. But there is a significant amount of work that has to be done at the distribution grid level. And as we think about, um, Robert, to your question, the integration of distributed energy resources, the vast majority of those are going to happen in a decentralized distribution grid. Um, and so within the stimulus packages um, and, and the recent infrastructure investment um, and Jobs Act bill that got passed in November, there's about $65 billion in the aggregate um, that we're tracking that ties to grid resiliency and broader grid investments. A portion of that will filter into public power and electric cooperative utilities, which, which more often than not, um, our, our focus, especially municipal owned utilities, are focused on distribution. Um, and so we see an increased uh, amount of activity across our own user community to access some of those funds or to prepare to access some of those funds in an effort to, to truly drive automation across the distribution grid and have that command and control capability towards the electric vehicle charging station, the solar inverters, the equipment that will support battery walls and a variety of other distributed energy resources. So um, we see about 65 billion um, in the aggregate towards grid in the Infrastructure Investment Act. I, I would also be remiss not to say that the American Rescue Plan that's already legislated and already in motion, um, we are witnessing states, counties and cities apply for funding not only to offset budget deficits from the impact of COVID-19, but also for resiliency. To that end, we've witnessed one of the first members of our user community, small utility in Utah, that actually submitted funding requests in an application and has accessed dollars through the American um, Rescue Plan Act to begin automating their distribution grid in anticipation of integrating electric vehicles and other distributed energy resources. Um, so I think there's some, in addition to, to the, the mega bill that's just been passed in November, there are both annual activities and certainly the Recovery Act um, that are accessible to the smaller utilities that we support today. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Beatty. Not hearing you, Jeff. No, I'm not getting you, Jeff. Let's go. Let's... How about how about now? Okay, go. Yep. Sorry. Um, I have another transmission question. Um, there's this uh, provision in this bill which allows DOE to come in as the anchor um, customer on new transmission for I think 50% of the capacity. My question is, um, this could be for Andrew or Justin or anybody who wants to take it. How helpful do you think that will be in spurring new construction? And then another specific question is just, uh, Andrew was talking about the, the strengthened backstop authority of FERC. Um, I think that only happens in these national interest electric transmission corridors. And my question is whether this bill contemplates DOE designating more of those corridors or whether we're still working with the ones that were designated some years ago. Andrew? Would you like to try that? And we'll go to Justin afterwards. 
Yeah, no, that, that that's that's a great qu question, Jeff. I, I think there's some new language in there on, on those uh, high interest uh, transmission corridors. So I, I think presumably it, it does tee up DOE to be maybe a little bit more aggressive in, in designating those. Um, you know, again, it, it, it you have to have those designated, and then it'll um, it will be reliant on FERC and and I think there's there will be a different conjecture as to how aggressive they will be in exercising that authority once those corridors are, are established. Thank you. Justin, do you have something to add to it? Uh, I, don't, I don't have much to add on this, just I guess just because of the sort of New York specific role that we play here. I think I think any any work by the federal government to serve as a sort of backstop or uh, effectively off taker of new transmission would would solve for a lot of market market and financing issues, I guess that that the industry faces. But for us, we're sort of limited here in who we can serve, um, given the statutory nature of our of our mandate. But um, but yeah, I think it would it would definitely drive a lot of development um, across the country. Thank you. And if I could interject here for just a moment, sure. um, just having been in that role of, um, of doing environmental analysis and transmission permitting, um, collaboration is really going to be the key. So even with these authorities, we still have to engage the public and get them to buy in because there's so many stakeholders. And a key lesson that the Department of Energy learned um, they established an interagency process to do the stakeholder engagement in like 2016 or 17. And I think tapping into those existing processes will really help to accelerate the progress because authorities are one thing, but convincing the public and everyone to go along with it, I think will really help to um, make it successful. I would like to ask anybody on the panel, when do you expect the money to begin to flow? Casey. Uh, that is so hard. It's anybody's guess. I'd, I'd, I'd almost like to put a little betting board on there to see what it what might be. Um, uh, I think it might happen faster than the stimulus from before because the there are people in place who have lessons, learns, and processes, but I think that's a tough one. Andrew? DOE has been uh, understandably reluctant about timelines. I, I think it, again, I kind of go back to uh, the, the, my view that DOE looks at this as transformational, not stimulative. I, I do think you'll see money coming out Q2, Q3 of, of next year, but this is a, this is a, a multi-year bill and, and DOE is, is trying to look for those transformative projects that can make real progress on, on moving us to net zero. Thank you. Ellie? I wanted to ask you all about um, energy supply chains. If you think that the bill does enough as far as, you know, research investments, that sort of thing, into, you know, things like critical minerals, solar panels, that sort of, if anybody would be willing to comment on that. I'm not sure if anybody uh, focuses on that. Anybody well, want to take that? Within the within the application process, um, from what we're gathering, certainly on behalf of the utilities we support, there 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 is going to be an allocation for grants that tie to um, innovative approaches to solving problems, um, and and we see opportunity there for our utilities, particularly those that are grant gathering granular data from the very edge of the grid to understand what's actually happening with the assets they're responsible for managing. I, I don't have a specific dollar amount for you, Ali, in, in that context, but um, from our perspective, the, the construction of the bill and the way we're evaluating it in conjunction with the utilities we support, we do see opportunity for innovation and for dollar allocations that will tie to those types of projects that, that really can move the needle towards broader resiliency. Um, you know, example, um, anecdotally, anecdotally for you, um, you know, in the deep freeze that unfolded in Texas earlier this year, we, we witnessed utilities leverage technology to drop their load profile by 50% with the push of a button on a computer screen, on a computer terminal. Um, a lot of hard work by their team, a lot of investment in technology 
and an understanding of how to use that technology. But we, we think it's, it's activities like that at the distribution level, especially for the munis and co-ops, which represent a meaningful percentage of the people in this country and the utility industry in general. Um, we think it's opportunities like that where, uh, where, where there will be grant allocations for utilities to test. So to that end, I, I, I can't give you a dollar amount, but we do think there is uh, that the bill considers those types of initiatives. Thank you. Ken Silverstein? Yes, I wanted to follow up on my colleague's question from s and um, There's this dual, uh, these dual goals that seem to be um, a little bit in conflict with each other. That is, we, we want to electrify everything as an effort to decarbonize, um, but the most immediately available resource to do that, to be fair, is natural gas. Um, but yet we want to go to these low carbon sources, uh, wind and solar and other low carbon sources. And so my question is, um, wh what, how do you think about this effort to electrify? Is it uh, electrify first and worry about re uh, adding renewables later? Or is it let's get our ducks in a row and make sure we bolster the wind and solar infrastructure in order to electrify with the lowest carbon sources. Justin, would you like to try that? Uh, sure, Luella. And I, I think that just thinking about it as you were posing the question, that to me, they, they would have to proceed on parallel tracks, right? You'd be working on the electrification track and at the same time, you're looking to decarbonize the energy delivery system. I don't think it's, you know, 100% on one track, you know, or put one, putting one in front of the other. I think they have to be proceeding in parallel would be my, my response. And Andrew, do you have something to add to that? I, I think it's an excellent question, Ken. I, I, I think at least how the administration views it, uh, you, it's, you can't divorce the infrastructure bill from the reconciliation bill that they're trying to pass and you know provide that long-term certainty for renewables to get more wind and solar on the system you know new tax incentives for storage that that can help with that uh intermittent issue i think gas you know i i is is and, and will remain an important part of of the electricity portfolio in this country. I think that the incongruence that you might see, I think advocates would say there's money in there for carbon capture. There, there's money in, in uh, other, in the reconciliation bill for addressing methane kind of throughout the supply chain for natural gas. So it doesn't get you, you know, to a hundred percent net zero, not necessarily, but it does um, move the ball forward on decarbonization while also going forward on this uh, path uh, towards electrifying more parts of the economy. Robert. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Justin, you mentioned that the NIPA could use some of the um, infrastructure funds for both, um, I guess, new and upgrades for transmission. Um, I'm just wondering if you have a sense of the breakdown there and just more generally, if, if people have an idea of how much of these funding, how much of these funds might go towards new projects versus might go towards um, upgrades and trying to accomplish this with what's already in the ground. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would defer to others on the, the ratio, I guess, of new, new to upgrades nationally. I think from our perspective, we have three major upgrade uh, projects underway. Um, and then we're partnering on the, uh, the Clean Path New York project, which would be new. Um, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all designed to do the same thing, which is to uh, relieve congestion on the system and free up uh, the delivery of renewables to downstate New York. Um, so for us, I think uh, we wouldn't have a priority upgrade versus new. Um, and we'd look to spread the, you know, any funding that might be available across across our transmission development portfolio. I'd like to ask Peter on the issue of uh, 
decarbonization. How is that affecting your smaller generators? Yeah, it's a uh, it, it's it's we, we talk a lot about it with um, the utilities we support on the challenge of being expected to electrify everything and simultaneously decarbonize their business, particularly um, for for the distribution utilities that are in many circumstances entering into power purchase agreements with the generators. Um, Llewellyn, we're, we're in, in, we run, in, just as an aside, we run an annual conference like many technology companies. We just completed ours in November. Um, we had for us a large event, 400 people from 100 utilities across the United States, um, public power and electric cooperative utilities. The number one concern that surfaced through the surveys that we ran was the impact the F-150 Lightning and the EV infrastructure is going to have on their broader system planning and what that means for within their system planning, the circuits, the feeders, the transformers. Um, and, and so I, I think what, what we're trying to do is in coordination and in alignment with the utilities we support is, is help think through something we refer to as, as really load control relative to their supply curve how do we help them more granularly control the demand curve at various times of the day and at various times of the year to mitigate imbalances between the two? Um, and, and as EVs really surface, especially with something as mainstream as the F-150, among the most popular vehicles in the United States, um, we're, we're witnessing significant activity across the smaller utilities that we support in preparing for it. Thank you. And um, Ken Silverstein. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask a question about distributed energy resources compared to central generation and, and the larger assets. Do you think the focus going forward is going to be on um, expanding the use of on site generation, storage, um, microgrids? Um, and building that part of the electricity economy, or do you think um, it's going to be more building these massive generation projects um, coupled with uh, long distance high power transmission lines? Who would like to take that? How about Justin? Okay, um, yeah, I mean, for us, I think, our, we, our state has um, set a goal of nine gigawatts of offshore wind, um, which is going to be a major component of, of uh, the effort to decarbonize. Um, but at the same time, we're also looking at all sorts of distributed resource type uh, uh, approaches, such as virtual power plants. So for our some of our governmental customers, like large colleges, uh, uh, other institutions or the MTA or Port Authority, they're all looking at uh, an integrated, distributed, decentralized energy system to, um, for, to support their energy needs and also as a, as a resilience uh, response. So I think, I think you're going to see both. Um, and I, you know, I, I think for us, it's, it only, we only get to our goals if, if we have both. I, okay. I, if I can, if I can jump in on that one, Llewellyn, um, sure. Ken, Ken's question, or, or provide some additional perspective from Justin's comments. Um, I, in the aggregate, the large projects will have the biggest impact in terms of decarbonization. In, in terms of consumer experience and reliability for utilities, our view is the decentralization of generation and the distributed energy resources will have a greater impact day to day. Um, we witnessed that with extreme weather that sweeps across a footprint and devastates the utilities infrastructure. Um, and, and how can they recover and deliver power as quickly as possible? Um, many ways in, in, from our view is if they have smaller pockets of distributed energy resources um, that can be dispatched and accessed and, and, and accessible quickly, uh, it will enable them as a tool in their arsenal to restore services in life-threatening situations as quickly as possible. With that said, in terms of broader decarbonization goals, the large wind farms and the large solar plants 
will certainly have a, a, a larger impact in the aggregate. I think they'll also take a lot longer um, to deploy and, and be in a position to dispatch. Thank you. We have some uh, holes that have come up over the transom. Some questions, one from Linda Gasparella. A question for Justin and Andrew, perhaps. The infrastructure bill establishes a first of its kind infrastructure financing authority. Do you have any, any insight into this new entity and how the utilities will avail themselves of it? Andrew. I, yeah, I think that's one of those areas that we're going to have to see how there's get some more guidance from from DOE on. Um, you know, I, I it it is a a really important part of, of the infrastructure bill, um, but and I think there's going to be um, certainly an, an effort by the department uh, to make it as accessible and easy for for stakeholders. Um, but it, I, I think that's probably falls into one of those buckets where DOE is, is actively looking at how they're going to stand this program up. Okay, thanks much. And another question from Andrew uh, Ten Ick. Uh, are, you, are there opportunities for the development of hydrogen direct air capture or CCUS as carbon capture utility and storage hubs to reduce emissions, Katie? Thanks, Llewellyn. And great question. Yes, there are. There are ample opportunities, and there's a big portion of this in the infrastructure bill. Um, EPRI, for example, has the Low Carbon Resources Initiative, which has about um, over $120 million um, invested in over 40 organizations collaborating to look specifically at hydrogen, ammonia, and other low carbon energy carriers for the future, and not just looking at how can it work from a generation standpoint, but how can it be delivered? How can it be used? You know, there's many facets of looking at how hydrogen can either be blended or fully used in the power system itself. Um, direct air capture and CCUS hubs. I believe there's a um, there's going to be not just hydrogen hubs, but there's also going to be a lot of um, uh, money set aside for carbon capture, and so that's something that's been studied for a quite a long time. And so with a concerted effort and collaboration and extra resources, perhaps we can finally solve that, um, make, make some real progress in solving both the carbon capture and storage. So get, lots of opportunities, thanks. Sorry, um, we're getting towards the end of our time. So we're gonna to have to be quite quick. I'd like to get a question in from everyone. And uh, let's begin with uh, <clears throat> Ellie. A question for Andrew, um, wanted to see if you could speak to kind of the nuclear, um, the important nuclear components of this bill that, um, uh, what is it, the, the credit and the credit program to keep existing nuclear reactors um, running that are at risk of early retirement, just how important that is for the fleet? I, I think really important. I think it's really important to, uh, to the industry and to the administration's goals of decarbonizing the electricity sector by 2035. Uh, you see uh, in the bill uh, this uh, the establishment of, of this program, and, and I think one of the important parts too is it allows reactors that are receiving uh, state support as well to be able to apply for that. We've we've seen um, some uh, states come in here, you know, kind of at the last minute and, and help some of the existing reactors. Um, you know, those programs are all different, but the DOE program. Um, I, I think will provide a real backstop um, for uh, for all existing reactors that are at the risk of, uh, of closure. I think the other part that's really important, and this kind of goes to the transformational part of, of this bill, is significant funding for the advanced reactor uh, deployment program for for new SMRs, advanced reactors. Uh, you know, these aren't aren't going to uh, be coming online tomorrow. Um, but we have already had two awards from the from the AD uh, ARDP program, and having that that significant funding, I think, will be important in moving those projects along. Thank you, Robert. Right. Yeah, we've talked a lot about um, transmission, distribution, some generation. Um, is there sufficient funding in the infrastructure bill 
to use less energy to uh, to improve the energy efficiency in this country. Maybe Katie, I don't know. Katie? I was looking for my notes. I know there is. Energy efficiency is going to be a key tool in the toolkit of going forward. So yes, there will be. And I think there will be ways to look at more efficiency and in, um, in industry and um, in buildings in particular um, that there's, um, I'll have to get back with you, but I think we've um, calculated like what that opportunity might be in energy efficiency. And um, I know that there's, you know, no, more guidance and standards that will come out to help um, um, drive greater energy efficiency as well. Thank you, Ken. Uh, um, I was just getting ready to tell you I had to run out the door of a dentist appointment, um, but I'll go ahead and, um, and ask my question. Um, it's, it's really on the role of nuclear energy uh, going forward. It, 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 I know we spoke that there was, there's not really a silver bullet in terms of, of specific energy sources um, uh, or, or technologies. However, renewable energy, I mean, uh, nuclear energy provides 50% of this country's carbon free power. It's already up and going. Um, it, they were expensive to build. I don't think there's any question about that. And my question is, is there a role in the United States for 1000 megawatt uh, nuclear power plants or will it be uh, these small modular reactors, um, uh, at least in this country, is the next possible investment? Anybody want to jump at that one? I'll, I'll jump into that one. If um, I, I think the, I, at least in my time, I've never seen so much support on both sides of the aisle for, for nuclear. I think there are a lot of challenges to building big new reactors. I, I don't see that happening, but I see, yeah, as we've talked about, the maintenance of the existing fleet occurring. And, and then there is significant money uh, from government and also from, from private sources, obviously Bill Gates being looked at for next generation reactors, whether it be SMRs, uh, other type of advanced reactor designs. And I, I think that's gonna be for new builds, that, that's gonna be the focus uh, in, in this country over, over the next 10, 15 years. And- uh, Small modular reactors. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Beatty, you got the last question. I wondered if anybody has any cybersecurity concerns related to this bill in the sense that, you know, there's going to be a huge rapid build out here with a lot of money. And, you know, a glass half empty view of that is that we're opening up a lot more access points for, you know, people who might want to penetrate our grid. Do you think the bill accounts for that? Anybody got any, want to take that one? Sure, Katie? I can jump in for that. I, I think that cyber security is a definite um, consideration and something that I saw that's different in this legislation, considering we're trying to be transformative, is last go round, it was sort of an afterthought that the aid Department of Energy had to put in um, as they deployed. So they put in that everyone must do a plan, but I'm seeing now proposed language that says, not just a plan, but an implementation of the plan. So putting a little bit more umph in there because you really need to build cybersecurity in and not bolt it on. Great, thank you. And you've had the last word in the answering part of this, uh, Katie, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of these wonderful people on the panel who've taken time from very, very busy schedules to be with us. I'd like to thank the US Energy Association and my colleagues of the media, also very busy and it's a pleasure to work with all of you. Uh, I want to thank also Dominic Levin, Senior Communications Coordinator at USEA, who keeps me straight and gets me on the air. And of course, Sheila Hollis, who will uh, say a final word. Sheila? Thank you so much, Llewellyn. And uh, uh, thanks to our remarkable panel and uh, the uh, wonderful reporters. Um, I think it was an extremely good program. One of the issues that uh, I, I wanted to raise and for thought for future is uh, what happens to Canada in this, since there is so much uh, interrelationship uh, between New York and Canada. 
but uh, we uh, continue on and I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful holiday and continue to think great thoughts and ask great questions. And we'll, we'll see you in the new year. Thank you all very much. Happy Thank Christmas. You. Thank you.